Welcome to the second class of our winter course on Eisenhower's presidency. Uh, as was the case last week, I am still Stacy Wallach, and I'm delighted to see you on this warm and balmy day. And uh, I want to uh, uh, first, if there is, as I said last week, if there are any people new to uh, Ali, I want to make a special welcome. You all look very familiar, so I'm not <laughs> sure that there's any uh, new folks. And I want to do two things before we start on the meat of today's course, um, uh, which really begins our look at Ike's presidency. Number one, uh, I have tried to time this and subsequent classes. So there's, unlike the first class, so there's considerable time for class discussion. And not just questions, but your own views, your own comments because uh, there is no false modesty when I say that the collective knowledge, experience, and wisdom in this room <coughs> is vastly greater than my own. The only real difference between us is I've chosen to stand up here and you've chosen to sit back there. That's, that's all there is. Uh, and the second thing, I want to just uh, take a couple of minutes to comment on my own thoughts about uh, last week's presentation in which we looked at Ike's uh, life up until the presidency. Um, and these are just my own personal thoughts. Uh, there's an old expression that I'm going to paraphrase. Uh, you can take the boy out of Abilene, but you can't take Abilene out of the boy. In the case of Eisenhower, I don't think that's true. I think there wasn't much of Abilene left in Eisenhower by the time he got to the presidency. He left uh, despite you know, a very intense uh, family life, uh, uh, four, five brothers, I always get it wrong, four brothers, five, five brothers, uh, two intensely religious parents, uh, a small town, uh, you know, that 10 years earlier had been the Wild West. Nonetheless, he spent four years uh, at West Point. And if you count those four years, he spent 41 years in the U.S. Army. I think that pretty much eliminated Abilene. And unlike uh, many Army officers, he got to travel the world, as you know from last week. He spent time in Panama. Uh, he spent some rather intense time in the Philippines. Uh, I didn't uh, mention, I don't think, that he and Mamie, when he was working for General Pershing, spent a fair amount of time in Paris and got to travel around France in the 1920s. And then, after he came back from the Philippines, spent time in Washington, which is a world of its own. Uh, uh, with, you know, working directly for General Marshall. And then from 1942 onward, as you know, uh, he spent a great deal of time in England and in Europe. After the war, he visited Russia. So by the time he gets to the presidency, he's, he's truly a world traveler. He's been in very sophisticated company. Uh, I just don't think there was much <coughs> of uh, Abilene, Kansas, remaining in Eisenhower on the brink of his presidency. Did he speak any other languages? I don't believe so. I don't, don't believe so. Speak uh, the, actually, although he's famous for um, malapropisms at his press conferences, he was an excellent, excellent writer. And many of his um, uh, ratings, you know, that when he would leave a position, the general in charge had to write up a, uh, uh, a review of his performance. And this is back in the day when nobody dreamed that he'd be a five-star five general. They frequently noted what an excellent writer he was. And the um, Eisenhower defenders after his presidency, you know, the fortress Eisenhower that I've mentioned, uh, are, are insistent that his um, malapropisms at press conferences was a deliberate plan to say confusing things 
in particular about uh, his willingness or not to use nuclear weapons to leave a very unclear gray area as foreign leaders thought about, well, we'll just do this or we'll just do that. And then someone say, would say, well, what about Eisenhower and all those nukes? So nobody could say that he was a warmonger, but nobody could say what his real intentions were. And at least on a couple of key occasions, I think that's absolutely true. Uh, I don't think he was a brilliant public speaker, but he was, a, as I say, a superb writer. Now, he <coughs> was also, on occasion, a liar. I mentioned to you, and this is ironic, given his later uh, reputation earned among generals and statesmen of the highest order as being a man of integrity, a guy who said what he meant and meant what he said and kept his word. And he really did have, uh, between 1942 and 1952, a reputation for that. As I told you last time, he lied to get into West Point. Mm -hmm. It was a pointless lie because he originally told a lie to avoid the um, uh, fact that he was too old to apply to the Naval Academy, which is where he actually wanted to go. And he repeated the lie uh, when he went and applied to West Point, even though they didn't have, they had a different window. His true age would have gotten them into West Point. What I didn't mention last time was that sometime in the early 20s, uh, when he had his first child, before his first child died, uh, he lied about a uh, expense reimbursement requisition. And although it was only for either $258 or $285, the, when it came to the attention of the adjutant attorney general, the adjutant general of the U.S. Army, that guy went after him like a dog goes after a bone and was going to court martial him. And had uh, the adjutant general had his way, uh, that would have been the end of his career because he had no real defense. His defense was, I didn't mean it, I'll give it back. You know, the bank robber's defense is he steps outside and the FBI says, hands up. And he goes, no, 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 I, while you're on your way over, I changed my mind. Uh, this is not the right thing to do. <coughs> or as they say in the NBA, no harm, no foul. <laughs> That was Eisenhower's defense. This adjutant uh, uh, general went after him with such vehemence and such insistence that this man be court-martialed that they had to kind of spirit him out of the country. That's how he ended up with Connor, General Connor in Panama. Uh, because again, Lucky Ike had mentors high up. And uh, uh, it was <coughs> partly to avoid uh, having to show up at the adjutant general's office and explain this $285 uh, that he ended up in Panama. And that never came up in any of the subsequent career changes? No, it was because he never was court-martialed. He, you know, avoided it. But it's, the records are perfectly clear. Yes, sir. I didn't have any very early last time, but to, to give it to a tall, incidentally, I think it was the veterans' strike. Really oh, the bonus marches? Uh, as a, uh, another one of my fans uh, uh, raised with me, because I didn't raise it last time and I'm not going to, there's an editorial function in what I do. He had a long, busy life. I cannot talk about everything, but I'll give you the short answer. He was MacArthur's assistant at the time. He was not in favor of what MacArthur did. He actually tried to persuade MacArthur to walk away from it because on the grounds that it, it wasn't appropriate for the Army Chief of Staff to be out there personally directing uh, the burning down of the bonus marches shantytown. MacArthur paid no attention. To show you how little attention MacArthur paid to anyone, President Hoover had a messenger hand deliver a direct order signed by Hoover saying, please leave them alone. Now that you've cleared the streets, back off. They'll dissipate on their, on their own steam. Mm -hmm. MacArthur paid no attention to Hoover's order and sent his men in and burnt down um, uh, the shanty town that they had built. Uh, and of course, these were all ex-soldiers. Uh, at least that's the version of the story that Eisenhower wanted everybody to know about long afterwards. And actually, I don't doubt it. 
uh, I wasn't there. I was busy somewhere else that day. I forget. <laughs> but more importantly, I've got to keep moving because uh, your point is. Uh, uh, I think that so, he was a little slippery on that. Yeah. Himself. The key. The key point is I am skipping over interesting parts of Eisenhower's life. I can't cover it all. Another aspect, though, that I want that I reflected on. Uh, based on last week's presentation was he had these two intensely religious parents. Uh, it was not a cult, but each of them belonged to a <clears throat> sect that was uh, of Christianity that was like the Puritans, just very, very intense, uh, very biblical. The Eisenhower family, the, the brothers, the two parents, uh, at least once a week on Sunday and often on other days of the week, would sit around reading passages from the Bible uh, in a very, and work their way through it and, uh, and discuss it after they finished a reading. Uh, not all that different from what, uh, the way uh, many Jews read the Talmud week after week after week and discuss it. Uh, this was that kind of intense religious family. Well, you're going to uh, be surprised that when uh, Herb Brownell, who you all remember was so critical in persuading him to run, <coughs> was, going, was sitting with him alone going down a checklist, a to-do list of you know, getting, getting the candidate ready. One of the items on the checklist was religion. Isaiah says, sure, Christian. And Brian says, yeah, what denomination? He says, no denomination. Well, where do you go to church? I don't go to church. Where does Mamie go to church? She doesn't go to church. Well, when you did go to church, he says, we've never gone to church, uh, ever. And he says, well, weren't you married in a church? He says, yes, her parents made us have a church wedding. All right, what religion were, you, were her parents? Presbyterian. Oh, says Bernard, no problem. You're Presbyterian. And by the way, after you get elected president, at least once a month, you're going to go to church, and we're going to take pictures of you going to church. <laughs> and that's kind of interesting. You know, you have this intense family uh, focus on religion, and the minute he got out of the family, never again. The other thing that I think uh, is uh, very, very critical to understand is that by the time he got to the presidency, from 1942 to 1952, he was continuously in high command, commander in chief of this or that. Uh, and he was in positions where he wasn't just in charge of the military subordinates. He was hobnobbing with presidents and prime ministers, uh, marshals of the Soviet Union. And uh, that's 10 years of being in command of giving orders and expecting them to be obeyed. And, uh, you know, with a lot of subordinates who are either going to carry out his commands or die trying. And in his case, quite literally. And finally, it is just remarkable, and I don't say this as a criticism, far from it, but just remarkable that a man who commands the largest armies in the history of the United States and, and part of the largest armies of, of World War II and is considered an enormously successful, successful commander in chief was never in combat. Somebody outside said, not for a day in his life. A day? Not for a minute. And I don't say that as a, as a criticism, not at all. This is a man who managed planned, led, executed superbly without having any uh, combat experience at all. So those are just my own personal thoughts on some of the uh, <coughs> interesting and paradoxical aspects of Eisenhower uh, up until 1952. And here he is in his official White House portrait. Pretty good looking guy, pretty healthy. And the 
He was very unknown. Uh, that's another thing to keep in mind. Remember, Truman was equally eager to have him be the Democratic nominee for president. And the truth is that on matters of foreign policy, military policy, and as we'll see later in the course, on some very critical domestic policies, Eisenhower was in complete sync with Truman and with Roosevelt, uh, particularly on military policy and foreign policy, but as you'll see, on some um, uh, major domestic policies. In fact, I'll give away something. Uh, I'll say something now that I really should reserve to later. Late in his presidency, he was with his personal secretary, Ann Whitman, and they were having a terrible time with uh, the uh, Taft wing of the Republican Party in Congress, the conservative wing, which was a very major part of the Republican Party. And he got so frustrated that, according to Whitman, he burst out with the following. I can't imagine why anybody would ever belong to the Republican Party. <laughs> and this is Mr. Republican. <clears throat> and as we've also understood, and, and uh, I think it's equally important to remember this, from his earliest youth up until he retired from the presidency, he had a terrible temper, which he spent his whole life trying to control with more or less success. And in fact, I think some of his, is there a doctor in the house? I think some of his illnesses, particularly his uh, ileitis, uh, were part, uh, partly caused by this intense effort on his part to discipline himself and not lose his temper uh, as often as he did. And when he lost his temper, I understand you could hear it through the entire White House. Now, a remarkable part of how crafty he was politically with a small p, but how naive he was about the capital P politics of Washington, D.C. I believe he's the only president in the history of the country who ever asked two advisors to just, you know, give him suggestions about who his cabinet members should be, and then took them, all of them. <laughs> And most of these folks, he didn't know. He had met a couple, you know, in the sense of like, uh, you know, in a receiving line, or they were both in the same meeting hall. But he didn't know any of these people. Uh, and yet, he trusted these two men uh, so much that uh, he just took all of their recommendations. Here's the cabinet, uh, plus some uh, deputies and some staff aides. This is their official uh, 1953 post-inaugural photograph, and uh, <laughs> they were eight millionaires and a plumber. Now, the funny thing is, the plumber was probably a millionaire too. He was the head of the pipe fitters union, and I, I don't want to cast aspersions, but my guess is that by the time he got to be president of the pipe fitters, let's put it this way, he was probably comfortable. <laughs> And he didn't last very long in the job. And they also had picked, uh, as I told you last week, uh, Nixon as vice president. He accepted, uh, even though he was the third choice. I wonder if he ever found out that he was third choice. Probably, right? And I love this picture because it really, to me, it looks like Dad bearing his son the morning after. <laughs> I mean, this is not a happy couple here. And uh, uh, here's, uh, this has nothing to do with today's presentation. I just what? happen to, here's uh, Nixon shaking hands with Fidel Castro. And uh, see, if you close your eyes while you're shaking hands, it doesn't count. Oh. It's like uh, if you eat off your spouse's plate, there's no calories in it. Right? And uh, does this have something to do with today's presentation? Not a thing, <laughs> nothing. But my lord, what a photograph, what a photograph. So let's, let's get serious. Uh, he picks the two Dulles brothers, and there are some uh, interesting things. Uh, Dulles, uh, on the left, John Foster, uh, who became Secretary of State, had uh, spent 
all of his adult life at the New York law firm of <coughs> Sullivan and Cromwell, uh, and uh, rose to be the senior managing partner. And uh, completely apart from his policies, he was pretty uh, right wing, uh, not in any kind of fanatical or absurdist way, but uh, pretty right wing. Uh, very anti-communist. Uh, he was also incredibly unlikable. Nobody liked him. Uh, <laughs> but he was so good at what he did. Like I mean, to become the senior managing partner of a law partnership and not be likable is a major achievement. <laughs> I have been there. Not at Sullivan and Cromwell. But in my own law firm, uh, it's hard to imagine a guy as unlikable as he was uh, rising to that kind of position. Eisenhower didn't like him either, but, but uh, had n you know, would have kept him the whole eight years, but un very unfortunately, and this time I'm not being sarcastic, uh, he got cancer, uh, and I think he died in 1958. Uh, Alan, his younger brother, had been involved in intelligence be before there was even an intelligence agency, starting in the 20s working for the State Department as a foreign service officer. He was heavily involved in intelligence activities, uh, went in and out of government, in and out of Sullivan and Cromwell, and uh, was the um, OSS um, uh, resident in Bern, Switzerland, during World War II, and actually accomplished some very interesting things, uh, including sleeping with all of his female spies. He was a serial adulterer to such a degree that his sister, Eleanor, who uh, was also just as bright and as accomplished as the two brothers and had a very distinguished career of her own, his sister, uh, when she was interviewed for some oral history project, said that just based on what she personally knew, he had over 100 adulterous affairs during his marriage. His wife knew a number, yes, he was busy, busy, busy. Uh, his wife knew a lot of these uh, women, and uh, one of them, in fact, became her lifelong best friend after the affair was over. Uh, because he never carried on these affairs for very long. They, they were not one night stands, uh, but they were not years and years and years. The reason I mention this is not for the gossip value. It is absolutely amazing that a senior intelligence officer who ultimately becomes the senior intelligence officer in the government should have, you know, a hundred or more sexual liaisons. <laughs> Times were different. Well, times were different. You're right. Now, the other thing, the other thing that's, hang on, hang on. Uh, we're going to open it up at the end. The other thing that's remarkable about him is that there was almost unanimous agreement that while he was a fine case officer, he was a terrible manager. And in fact, he had been passed over for the job of CIA head twice uh, by Truman. Uh, who valued his uh, expertise and experience. But he was a terrible manager, and during the Eisenhower administration, uh, there were uh, enormous complaints that the agency was not functioning well because he was not very good at running a big organization. Ike was the first president to have a national security uh, staff advisor. I'm talking about the people you may know later, um, uh, Kissinger under Nixon, um, uh, Brzezinski under Carter. Uh, who was Clinton's? Uh, forget. But, Albright. Uh, yes, Madeleine Albright for at least part of it. Before she was secretary. Yeah, but wasn't she the she national was security advisor Albright. first? Yeah. He began. Eisenhower began it. He was. Uh, uh, it was a military model, and with one exception, I think every president since Eisenhower has uh, kept that office and relied on it. Uh, Andy Goodpaster uh, was his gatekeeper for the whole eight years, uh, and every president since has also had a gatekeeper, because without a gatekeeper, you get drowned. 
he had three secretaries of defense, uh, all pretty good. Now, I will correct one uh, myth. Uh, Charlie Wilson, who is uh, the CEO of General Motors before he was appointed, supposedly said, what's good for General Motors is good for the country. Actually, what he actually said was the opposite. When people raised the conflict of interest, you know, he said, what's good for the country is also good for General Motors. A very different statement. Eisenhower picked him for, I think, a superb reason. Eisenhower knew the military better than any recent president, and he knew especially how the Defense Department under the reorganization that Truman effected uh, had become huge and bloated and difficult. And he figured, I'll put in charge a guy who has successfully run a big organization. I think it's a very fine uh, decision on Eisenhower's part. And actually, the three of them together uh, uh, did a pretty good job, as you'll see, of cutting the Defense Department down to size. He had two Treasury Secretaries, both conservative banker types, uh, who, uh, you, know, you know, the old thing about the first uh, duty of a physician is first do no harm. Well, they only did a little harm. <laughs> uh, as, as has been true of so many of our um, uh, Treasury secretaries, they either don't understand Keynesian economics or they think it's uh, the wrong religion. You know, they, they understand it and they, they conclude that it's so evil. You know, we, we, and unfortunately, there are times when uh, that attitude really damages the economy. Here's his two attorneys general, Herb Brownell, you met last week. Um, uh, Bill Rogers was his um, uh, junior, his <coughs> deputy, uh, uh, and uh, it was really a mentor-mentee relationship. And it was a good partnership because Bill, uh, in the uh, last years of the Eisenhower presidency, as we'll see when we talk about civil rights, played a very, very uh, useful role. Uh, here's one of the eight millionaires on the left, the Commerce Secretary Sinclair Weeks, uh, the plumber on the right. He did not last long. His two in interior secretaries, uh, Doug McKay and Fred Seaton, I tried to find something wonderful that they did to tell you about. <laughs> I couldn't. And here's a really interesting guy, uh, Ezra Benson. Uh, it did not cause a stir that he was a very high official, an extremely high official, one of the 12 apostles of the Mormon church, uh, and later became the chief apostle after he left uh, office. Uh, and this is at a time uh, when the Mormon church was not exactly in the broad uh, progressive wing of American culture, and yet it didn't cause a stir at all. An outspoken opponent of communism and socialism he actually opposed uh, price supports for farmers. He, he by the way, was born a, into a farm family and his first full-time adult work was as a farmer. And he said the John Birch Society was, quote, the most effective non-church organization in our fight against creeping socialism and godless communism. And as you can see, he published a 1966 article entitled, quote, Civil Rights tool of communist deception. <laughs> it was a different time. Of course, the people who agree with him are still very much around, although it's their children and grandchildren spouting the same kind of stuff. Ike uh, uh, was delighted with Secretary uh, Hobby, Ovita Kulp Hobby, because he, he had actually known her slight, he, he knew of her work in the Roosevelt administration, uh, and he correctly figured out that she was uh, one of the most hardworking public officials of her generation. She was one of these amazing workaholics, very effective, uh, very smart, uh, and um, uh, she was, I think, the first person to occupy the post of Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, and really set the standard uh, for what was to come. <coughs> 
And uh, over the wall was His Eminence, uh, J. Edgar Hoover, uh, who immediately uh, on uh, Eisenhower's election opened a file on Ike, <laughs> naturally. Here he is with his deputy, Clyde Tolson. Um, yes. Not just the shoes, the socks, the pants, the shirt. I'll bet you they had matching ties. He just took his <laughs> off because they're at the beach. They lived together. They vacationed together. They had uh, breakfast and dinner together. Uh, and the best you can say is one historian who is literally bending over backwards to be fair said, well, it was a brotherly affection. <laughs> and maybe it was. Uh, that's, you know, that's a whole nother course for a whole nother time. The Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, this is who he inherited from Truman, his close friend and colleague uh, from uh, World War II, Omar Bradley was the chairman, uh, Colin Specteller and Vandenberg all had outstanding reputations built on outstanding service during World War II. And interestingly enough, he declined to reappoint any of them by the summer of 53, six months after Ike took office. They were all gone. And you'll see why in a moment. They were replaced by equally uh, 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 superb uh, military brass. The chairman is uh, Admiral Radford, uh, Matt Ridgway, who uh, had a superb World War II record and then uh, really ended the Korean War by reestablishing uh, uh, the uh, American forces and Republic of Korea forces at the 38th parallel, where we could call it quits. Uh, Nathan Twining, the Air Force chief. Uh, these are all superb guys. Ike didn't like them either. Uh, in fact, he tried to get rid of them. And the reason was none of them bought into the concept of the new look, which we're going to look at in one second. What's particularly upsetting, what was particularly upsetting for Ike was that once he realized that these fellows didn't buy into the new look, when he interviewed these guys before he appointed them, he said, now here's the new look, A, B, C, D, E. Are you okay with that? You gonna buy into that? You gonna defend it? Yes, sir. <laughs> and then a month later, six months later, a year later, each of these fellows ended up in front of Congress and some congressman would say, you know, at a hearing, uh, well, what about this new look? And not one of them was in favor of it. And you'll see why, and, and that infuriated Ike. Ike understood uh, that he couldn't just call up a congressman or a senator and order him to do X or Y or Z. But he certainly thought, that he could take a bunch of generals and admiral, admirals and say, you're going to do X, you're going to do Y, and you're going to do Z, and you're going to be happy about it. And that wasn't the case. That wasn't the case, and it infuriated Ike. So let's take a look at the new look. No more limited wars. And more deeply, although he didn't articulate it this way, but you'll see, no more acting as the world's policeman. And I, right now, I want you to leap forward to young Jack Kennedy at his inauguration. You know, I'm part of the Camelot generation, you know, oh, Jack Kennedy, I love you. But remember what he said in his inaugural speech. We're gonna defend any friend, we're gonna fight any foe, we're, go we're gonna be the world's policeman. And you all know what happened to that. Ike was different. He saw no need to be the world's policeman, although he saw other needs, which we'll get to in a second. And his theory of what to do with uh, expansive international communism, and in particular the Soviet Union and the Chinese, was back off or we'll nuke you. And he meant it, I think. But you may have a very different view after we look at the next few slides. <coughs> Unlike Many conservative presidents who talk the talk and don't walk the walk, Ike shrunk the army. And in a very short space of time, by June of 55, 
you know, which is just six months into his second term. A half a million men had been sent home. The Navy and the Marines shrank from one million to 870,000 and the Air Force grew slightly from 950,000 to 970,000. And he actually, as part of no more limited wars, no more police actions, no more Koreas, and his view that if you really are threatening the existence of the United States, we're going to nuke you. So he shifted the um, Defense Department budgets over this five years so that 40% of the budget was going to the Air Force, which infuriated the Army and the Navy, which had been the senior services. In fact, through World War II, the Air Force was just a unit of the Army. It was the Army Air Force. It was only in the reorganization under Truman after the war that they became an independent unit. And suddenly they're getting 40% of the budget caused a lot of upset. Military brass across the board loathed the, the new look. And they couldn't help themselves when they were called in front of Congress and some senator would say, well, uh, General, what do you think of the new look? <coughs> they could not bring themselves to defend it. Ike, however, loved it because not only did it accord with his idea of how to manage America in the new world uh, of the 1950s, it allowed him to significantly cut the defense budget and balance the government's budget. Now, he didn't have a balanced budget in every year of his eight years because some things happened where he had to spend more money. But in quite a few of those years, he did have a balanced budget. So he was relying at the outset of his presidency in terms of talking the talk on nuclear deterrence. You, you want to get into some local war? Let others take care of it. We don't have to be involved. You want to challenge our existence? We're going to nuke you out of existence. And he wasn't kidding. Uh, we had an aggressive policy of nuclear testing and of uh, um, building bigger and better bombs and building a variety of different uh, delivery systems. Uh, and ultimately, in one or two of his presidential years, the budget wasn't balanced because he was spending money uh, uh, developing ICBMs. Uh, developing what would later become uh, the um, Poseidon submar the submarines uh, armed with Poseidon missiles. They actually went into service under Kennedy, uh, but all the uh, planning and design and construction was done in the latter years of Eisenhower's presidency. And you'll see how aggressive he was. That was his theory. <coughs> we get more bang for the buck we can limit the size of the military, limit the size of the military budget, uh, and be effective in the world because nobody's going to mess with us. And you'll see, oh yeah, but there are these little wars? That didn't bother him. Let others, and you'll see some examples of it. This again, what we're now about to see is some of my editorial work. We can't look at every little incident that occurred during his eight years, but there were plenty. Now, did it work? I would say this is the most important thing to know about Ike. And we're going to look at some bad things about Ike. And you're going to hear, whether you happen to agree with me or not, over the coming classes, you're going to hear me say some pretty critical things about Eisenhower. But you cannot get out from under this fact. Right? It's just extraordinary. From June of 53 through June of 61, U.S. military forces were never in combat. Yeah, I know, he sent, uh, uh, what, 1,800 Marines into Lebanon. Uh, he sent them in at the express invitation of the president of Lebanon. They stayed there for 90 days. He pulled them out. They were never in combat. Nobody fired at them. They didn't fire at anybody. And that was the purpose. It was a show. Uh, and uh, it quieted things down. Lebanon was going through a little bit of upset. No U.S. military forces engaged in combat for eight years. Now, did that justify placing much of the world, including us, and I mean me, and I'll bet you all of you, 
under the threat of nuclear annihilation. That's me right there. Right? Actually, since I'm a W, this is, well, I, I, here, this is me. In fact, that looks like me. <laughs> Only in New York. Here they are in the basement. They don't even have a desk to hide under. You know, listen, you want to hear the ultimate absurdity? Here, I'm, I'm born and raised in Lemonster, Massachusetts, down the road. And we were in the Field Street School, an elementary school, six grades and four rooms. Uh, I could tell you some more interesting things about it, but not on camera. <laughs> it's now the, it now houses the Lemonster Historical Society because it was actually built in the late 1860s. And that's where I went to school. We had, elsewhere in town, a one-room schoolhouse uh, with several grades in it. And they couldn't put us in the basement for our nuclear alerts. And there were some reasons, right? There was no basement that we could all get into. So we had to leave the school, march down to the end of the block, into the junior high school, and down into their basement. Yeah, that'll work. That'll work. Bomb shelters? A national cottage industry. I, I, I wish I had more time to show you some of the photographs of the various homemade bomb shelters. But of course, we can laugh now. Nobody was laughing at the time. Nobody thought it was funny. And it wasn't funny. Uh, yet Eisenhower is our nation's only 20th century two-term president to stay out of war for his entire two terms. Only two-term president where we stayed at peace. I don't care what else you say about Eisenhower, and you're going to see I'm one of his biggest critics. This puts him in the category of a great president. Uh, and I, I find myself fighting against that uh, designation because I was born and raised in, in a uh, uh, Roosevelt, Truman, Stevenson family. Uh, and, you know, Eisenhower to me growing up was, well, let's put it this way. I've changed my mind. The, the facts are the facts, and they cannot be denied. So Stalin, uh, and by the way, Eisenhower after World War II, when he went to Russia, met Stalin. He met him at Yalta. You know, uh, this, this guy Ike was, by the time he got to the presidency, was a world traveler in very high and mighty circles. And Stalin did him an enormous favor on March 5, 1953. By the way, you know who this guy is on the left? Stalin. Oh, my God. 22 years old, 1902 or 1903, something like that. Gorgeous, right? So short. Maybe this is uh, this is this is uh, 40 40 years later. I think he was 63 when he died. The favor he did was, of course, he died. Uh, uh, two months after Eisenhower took the oath of office as president. And by the way, I'm not joking about that. Uh, the leadership that Ike had to deal with after his death uh, was much more malleable uh, than Stalin. Uh, and although some opportunities, as we'll see, were lost, uh, Part of the reason that Ike was able to keep the peace was that Russia, for quite a few years after Stalin's death, had turned inward. The, the leadership succession was very, very difficult. It took years to work that out. Uh, the whole inward-looking process <coughs> began with Stalin's death, uh, and Ike benefited from that, as did we. So since they had more important things on their minds, uh, starting in March of 53, like figuring out how they were going to survive the next day or two or three, the Russians suddenly lost interest. You know, they had been providing the Chinese with enormous amounts of arms and equipment so the Chinese could fight the good fight in the Korean War. You should pardon the expression, fight the good fight. Fight their fight. Within a few months, 
uh, before uh, Stalin's death, they had uh, put the Chinese on a cash and carry basis. And you have to remember that although the Chinese had superbly disciplined foot soldiers, uh, they were at that time still a very primitive society. They had very little ability to mass produce uh, large amounts of sophisticated arms and armaments. They were really dependent on Russia for that. And thanks to Matt Ridgway, uh, who came in, you know, after uh, Truman fired MacArthur, and who did a superb job in Korea, they had been losing huge numbers of their best troops huge amounts of equipment. They were having trouble feeding their uh, troops. Getting, they had difficulty just transporting uh, warm clothes and boots and food to the frontline troops. They were ready to call it quits too. Uh, and that contributed a good deal to the decision uh, by the Chinese to make peace or at least reach an armistice. I love this picture on the right says it all as far as I'm concerned. And uh, so what's uh, kind of curious is they sign an armistice at the 38th parallel where the war began and they're still there. Uh, nothing's changed in all of these decades. And occasionally it turns into a shooting uh, war. This is something that a lot of folks really don't understand fully, I have a feeling many of you do understand fully. The Joint Chiefs or the National Security Council or uh, John Foster Dulles or some combination of them on a number of occasions urged Ike in particular situations to use nuclear weapons against the opposition. Uh, sometimes it was the Soviets, sometimes the Chinese, sometimes the Vietnamese. Ike said no each time. It's now documented, he said no, nine times. Nine times in eight years, he was urged to resolve a particular situation by nuking the other side. On at least one or two of those occasions, he was the only person in the room who was against it. Wasn't Dallas known for just brinksmanship, taking us to the brink? Well, yes, and uh, if we have time, we'll talk about that. And, and he did that at Eisenhower's urging. The idea was to scare the rest of the world on a, on a matter that Eisenhower thought was important to the direct security of the United States, to scare whoever it was making the threat that, hey, we're serious. We're the crazy guys with all these nuclear weapons. Uh, but if you stop to think about brinksmanship uh, as a negotiating tactic, for the senior diplomat of the United States, it's lunacy. But we'll see that Ike was no lunatic. Curiously enough, although it's sort of, uh, I'm not sure how relevant it is, but it's curious. At Yalta, where he was simply a, an advisor who came in periodically when the big guys uh, wanted to hear from him, he was the only guy at Yalta among the senior people who was actively opposed to dropping the bomb on Japan. Now, you may well disagree with that. I, I myself uh, am not happy that we did it, but I am of the view that Truman probably did the right thing, uh, as he saw it at the time, based on the information he had at the time. So here's an incident. You all remember uh, the French who were trying to reclaim Vietnam. Uh, as one of their colonies. In fact, they were trying to reclaim all of Indochina as their colonies after the war. Roosevelt was absolutely opposed to it. Truman had no sympathy for it. And Ike had no sympathy for the French. And they came when Diem Bien Phu. The French had set up Diem Bien Phu. They had, they had this view that if they lured the Viet Minh into this trap that they set, uh, that they'd be able to wipe them all out and turn the tide of battle. Uh, someday, if we have time to spend on the idiocy uh, of the French generals in setting it up so that they ended up as the uh, army in the trap, we, we can have a good time with it, except, of course, a lot of men died. A lot of men died. Uh, I can remember seeing newsreels of uh, 
Colonel Castries and just being overwhelmed. I, I wasn't that old. Uh, being overwhelmed that this is the ultimate valorous, uh, courageous captain of the army. Uh, he had an impossible task, and he knew it. From day one when they sent him in, he knew it. This is one of the really brilliant uh, military men of the 20th century. You all know about him. And the French came to us and literally said, would you mind if we borrowed a couple of nukes? They literally came over and said, we need a couple of nuclear bombs to clear up this problem. Uh, to borrow. Uh, you might ask, how are they going to give it back? It's like borrowing chewing gum, right? And, uh, uh, and they also said, oh, and by the way, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be opposed to lending us the airplane to deliver it. And, and a lot of senior American officials, both military and civilian, thought, well, it's the French. Gotta, gotta support our allies. But uh, Eisenhower, of course, had had a very close up personal experience with de Gaulle during World War II. Uh, he's one of the few, few senior Allied commanders who could more or less get along with de Gaulle. Because I think he understood what de Gaulle was trying to achieve, which was you know, very, very difficult to sort of personally, just in your own person, resurrect the honor of France under very difficult circumstances, to say the least. Um, and of course, he'd had a horrible experience with the Vichy French that he found in North Africa uh, when he was head of the invasion of North Africa. Uh, and he did not have any sympathy for their colonial uh, policy. Uh, so against the advice of much of the senior American officials, both military and civilian, he just said no. And uh, yet he gave them lots of other armaments. He gave them as much in military assistance <coughs> as we gave the f nation of France in martial aid to rebuild France after World War II. We gave them about, the, it depends on how you count, but very roughly we gave them about $3 billion in martial aid to rebuild France. And that's what they got. 2.8, 2.9, almost $3 billion in American armaments uh, to try to turn the tide in Vietnam, including, and this was a secret for a long, long time, including American pilots. And uh, uh, it was not a happy situation. Uh, when the airstrip was finally uh, closed down with uh, Viet Minh artillery fire, they had a parachute in the stuff, and most of it ended up in the v uh, <coughs> Surgical precise parachute drops did not exist. <laughs> a puff of wind, and it was on the wrong side of the line. And in the end, of course, the French had to pull out, and the Russians and the Americans and the Brits came in, and there was a, um, a peace made that we didn't actually we were not a signatory, we were an observer. And we didn't, and it, it called for the country to be temporarily split into North and South. And in 56, there were supposed to be nationwide elections. And we did nothing to enforce it because by this time, uh, the State Department had figured out that the only likely winner of a nationwide election was Ho Chi Minh. And, uh, uh, the Eisenhower and his fellow Republicans, just and, and a lot of other Americans of every political persuasion, uh, just couldn't bear having an internationally supervised democratic election that would elect a communist regime. It just seemed uh, antithetical to everything that democracy was all about. We still have that problem. When <clears throat> in the Middle East, when we have uh, an election and, and an Islamist group wins the election, we Americans have a great deal of difficulty with that. By the way, uh, Colonel de Castries, who, when he was forced to surrender, the French marked the occasion by making him a brigadier general. You stop and think that through, right? You lose, it's okay, we promote you, and it's going to be nice. It's really, it's okay. They call that failing upwards. That's, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Failing upwards. Yeah. So, uh, 
here's another incident uh, that lasted not only for the eight years of Eisenhower's presidency on and off, but uh, through much of Kennedy and Johnson's period. Uh, now, what's really critical, because I'm sure you all remember the names Kimoy and Matsu, at least generally. Now, here is Formosa or Taiwan, right? And it's pretty good sized, and it's 110 miles away from China across the Taiwan Strait. So uh, when uh, um, Chiang Kai-shek and a million and a half of his followers uh, retreated off of the mainland in 1949, you know, they were pretty safe across 110 miles of water because the Chinese had no navy to speak of and no ability to attack, no realistic ability to attack uh, uh, Taiwan. But Chiang, uh, was insistent in those days that this was just a temporary setback and that he was going to go, uh, of course it's absurd, uh, he was a two-bit, penny-ante, uh, corrupt warlord who couldn't even run his own little province. But he had a gorgeous, smart wife who came over to the U.S. and everybody fell in love with her, including most of all Henry Luce, the publisher of Time Magazine, and she engendered an enormous amount of support for him. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, the Republican Party mantra in those days was uh, the Democrats lost China and we're going to help the uh, Shang, uh, regime win it back. And so they started by fortifying Kimoy and Matsu, the, that is the nationalist Chinese did. And I want you to look at where it is. Here's 110 miles away, uh, Taiwan. But here, right here, is Kimoy, about a mile offshore, and Matsu, some, right in here, this one, right here. Now, you could argue, as a practical matter, that this is a, Taiwan is a different place. It's 110 miles away, it's an island. There are lots of island nations, after all. England is only 26 miles away from France. And there was a time when France claimed England. Uh, and there was a time when England claimed France. Uh, and 26 miles, it's still an island. This is 110 miles. By Hawaii. Sure, sure. But here, an island a mile offshore that sits inside the port. <coughs> I mean, if that isn't part of China, I don't know what is. Uh, but, uh, so the Chinese started shelling them when uh, Xiang put 15,000 troops in there. Uh, and I'll make a long story short. They shelled them for two decades, forever, on and off. The best was towards the end, uh, in the second term of Eisenhower's presidency, when they had reached a sort of modus vivendi, uh, the Chinese uh, be, and partly, by the way, because they were a little nervous that um, Ike might nuke them because there was a lot of talk in the United States about how this is terrible and the way to solve this is to just obliterate China, right? So they reached the modus vivendi and for quite a, a, I think a couple of years, the Chinese would shell Kamoi and Matsu on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. <laughs> And the shells were not filled with explosives. They were filled with propaganda leaflets. <laughs> and that, was, that satisfied their sense of honor. In the meantime, uh, when it looked like it was going to get into a hot war, Ike sent elements of the Seventh Fleet into the Taiwan Strait, you know, right down here. And at that time, the Chinese had nothing in that class. In fact, it's only recently that they uh, launched, uh, like, in the last year, they launched their first aircraft carrier. Which they blocked and sold. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and rebuilt, <laughs> and rebuilt. Uh, but just to have a new one, it's, you know, in 2012, they finally got an aircraft carrier. So um, you got you to gotta keep in perspective how aggressive the Chinese really uh, were. Uh, we sent in quite a few large ships, and we, we kept the peace. Uh, and it was hard for a Republican president when 
uh, half of his political party were saying, let's not just go in, let's nuke them. And they were serious about that. Uh, even though, as Ike pointed out, we had no strategic interest. We had no dog in that fight. So another uh, critical part of the new look as it was publicly enunciated was that unlike the Truman policy based on George Kennan's um, thesis, uh, unlike the Truman policy of containing Soviet expansion and Chinese expansion, uh, the Republicans, uh, and this was part of the 52 election campaign, part of the platform, we're going to roll back communism. Roll it back. I love that phrase. We're going to roll it back, <laughs> particularly in Eastern Europe. Uh, and remember, uh, a significant portion of the population of the United States uh, had relatives in the countries of Eastern Europe. A lot of them uh, had, you know, like Poland, for example. A lot of people in the United States uh, had mothers and fathers or grandparents still living in Poland and in Hungary and in uh, all of Bulgaria, all of Romania, hello. They talk the talk. And, and Ike often sent Dulles out front to do the talking. Got to roll them back. But they never walked the walk, never. 1953, the East Germans revolt against Soviet rule, throwing uh, stones at tanks. I mean, that's a serious effort by an Eastern European country to roll back the Soviet Union. <coughs> the United States did nothing. We encouraged them in, in our Voice of America broadcast, like a, like a football team, the underdogs. Go team, go. But do we actually do anything to help them? Not a thing. Early 56, the Poles revolted against Soviet rule. They actually had a little more success, a little more success. Same thing, stones in the street against tanks. We did nothing to help them, zero. October 56, the most infamous, the Hungarians revolt. And you can see now they at least have pistols and pop guns. This is either uh, the painters or the bakers, I forget which, but you know, they're going to throw rye bread at them. <laughs> we did nothing. Now, these are facts. You talk the talk, fine. But what did we do when the opportunity arose? Thank you. The technical term is gornished. <laughs> gornished. Yes, but, but he never said, quote, we're not the world's policemen in public. He never said that in public. Mm -hmm. Their consistent theme was, you mess with us, we're going to nuke you. Mm -hmm. and, it, and the Republican mantra was, roll them back. And he sent out Dulles to make speeches all across the country. There's a million speeches. You can check it out yourself online. It's, it's all there. Communism is evil, the Soviet Union is the evil empire, and we've got to push them out and free the people of Eastern Europe. Now, what did he do? Hang on. What did he do? He strengthened NATO. He installed nuclear missiles above ground in Turkey. I, the reason I say above ground is because, of course, they're only good for a first strike. If you let the other side strike first, they're not defensive anymore. They're vanished. So they're only a first strike weapon. He formed CENTO, the, uh, the uh, Middle Eastern version of NATO. He formed CETO, the Southeast Asian version of NATO. He created the ANZUS Treaty with Australia, New Zealand, and the US, us. Uh, he kept nuclear armed B-52s in the air off Russia's coastline. 24 hours a day. Now just let that sink in for a moment. Here you are in the Kremlin trying to get the evil empire up and running 
And there are nuclear armed B 52s circling your coastline 24 hours a day. All right? and, and all over, uh, out of Alaska, out of Maine. Primarily Maine. Oh, Maine, fine. And ultimately, although they came to fruition uh, a little bit after he left office, Eisenhower had created the planning and the design and the money to have uh, nuclear submarines armed with uh, nuclear tip Polaris missiles in place. In fact, as Bob pointed out. Actually, there were Regulus missiles yeah. on a few submarines which were nuclear armed in the middle <coughs> 50s. And by the end, by the time Kennedy came around, uh, uh, you know, by 63, 64, just as the B-52s were up in the air, the submarines circled the entire Soviet Union with uh, ballistic missiles. Uh, this, this is serious business. What good did it do? Another word for Ike's policy, in fact, contain. It's the Truman <coughs> Kennan policy of containment. You can talk all you want about uh, rollback, but what he actually did was do his best to contain uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, and remember, this is at a time when Americans of all political persuasion thought that, regardless of what they uh, thought about, you know, the Soviet Union in other respects, they thought that uh, uh, the Soviet Union's intention, as was the Chinese intention, was to expand. Uh, be, and the reason they thought that was that the Soviet and Chinese leaders talked about that. I mean, you know, uh, if they talk about it enough, you start to believe it. And so what he did over the course of his eight years was to follow Truman's lead and create a ring of steel, a nuclear ring around the Soviet Union and China. That's containment. Right? They were refueled in the air so they could go for long periods on station without having to land. And the Soviets, you know, at the various air shows, got a real close look at this eight-engine behemoth. And they didn't have anything like that at the time. Later they did, but not in the 50s. Oh, <coughs> we forgot the third leg, our aircraft carriers, with <coughs> squadrons of fighter bombers uh, capable of carrying nuclear weapons. And we had a lot of carriers. By the end of the 50s, we had a lot of carriers. And guess where they were? Circling uh, the Soviet Union. So you've got um, B-52s. You've got aircraft carriers. Uh, towards the end, you have nuclear submarines. Uh, and then you have some above-ground missiles <coughs> like the ones we put into Turkey. <coughs> And here's, here's uh, Khrushchev, uh, Bulganin, uh, I forget the names of some of these other fellows, but you, yeah, yeah, which one is he? This, this one, yeah. They could not have been all that comfortable because they didn't have anything collectively that matched that. Yet Ike as you know, wanted peace with the Soviets. Um, he went to, the, uh, to Geneva in 1955 and uh, uh, proposed something that was very popular but I, with the American people, but uh, I think was very bad diplomacy on his part in terms of procedure. He, he went to Geneva and threw a surprise on the table. He said, let's have an open skies program. We don't want to nuke you into the Stone Age. We feel pretty sure you don't want to do that to us. <clears throat> let's sign a treaty that says you can fly airplanes with uh, cameras across the United States and photograph everything. And we'll do the same across the Soviet Union. And we'll each see uh, on a constant basis that we're not preparing for war and we'll live in peace together. Well, the, it was a very popular idea. He came back 
to <coughs> Washington, you know, to a hero's welcome. The problem was, you're dealing with the most paranoid empire in the history of the world, and you throw a surprise on the table with no prior negotiation at a lower level, uh, no preparation, no working it through. What do you think? And, uh, you know, it was absurd from a uh, from the viewpoint of trying to actually get uh, the Soviet Union to agree to it. It was no surprise that Khrushchev listened, you know, through his interpreter, and immediately said, no way, Jose. No way. He's not doing it. Part of the reason was he, he was embarrassed at the thought of having us discover how little they had. The Soviet Union had been devastated by the Germans during World War II. They had only begun to start the process of recovery. And the notion that America should fly airplanes across the Soviet Union was anathema to him because it would reveal just how weak and devastated they, they were. So Ike, you know, really felt like if, if, he, if he's going to make progress in, in a world peace, he's got to have more information to persuade the other side that um, and, and uh, the Americans also, that really the Soviets are not a, an imminent threat to our existence. And he finally gets his wish with the U-2. This is the U-2. And it was an amazing airplane, you know, uh, built and designed by Lockheed to Ike's specifications. But if you stop and think for a minute, since we were an airplane crazy country, you know, we invented it, we loved it, it's, it doesn't shock me that we were able to develop an airplane that could fly at 70,000 feet. Actually, later, later versions could fly even higher. It doesn't shock me. It was a fabulous engineering achievement. What is shocking was the camera that Mr. Land of the Polaroid developed that from 70,000 feet could take uh, thousands of these detailed photographs of crystal clarity, where you could read the license plate on Khrushchev's limo. Uh, that, I mean, that is an absolutely stunning engineering achievement. And after a lot of debate, first he had them uh, fly along the Russian border with Turkey and some other places and, and test out that it really was as good as uh, the CIA said it was because the CIA was put in charge of running the program once, once they were operational. And then they started making flights across Russia and taking these photographs. And what a lot of people don't fully uh, understand is the Russians knew. They could see them on radar. They knew where they were coming from and who they were. Uh, and they were humiliated by their inability to shoot them down. They sent their fighter planes up and they get up to, I don't know, I'm guessing 50,000 feet and shoot off an air-to-air -air missile and it would fall harmlessly below uh, the airplane. Uh, and as it dawned on them month after month after month that the Americans had this ability to invade their sovereign space with impunity, it must have been shocking beyond belief because now it's in your face. Anytime we want to send over a nuclear bomb, we do whatever we want with you, Mr. Soviet Union. We just do whatever we want. Uh, that must have been horrifying uh, for the Soviets. And one offshoot of that was that they, they never said boo about it because they didn't want to admit publicly that they had no ability to, to shoot these planes down. Eisenhower felt that this was incredibly important intelligence information because it confirmed what he had suspected, that the Soviets did not have massive numbers of bombers and bombs and missiles, and all, that, that, that they had very little, and that they weren't on the edge of war, that they were, in fact, very busy trying to rebuild their society. So feeling certain that the Soviet Union uh, did not pose an imminent threat, but, by the way, unwilling, I, I'm talking about I, unwilling to explain to the American people why because he felt, for a variety of reasons, that he had to keep the U-2 and its camera super, super secret.
and that ultimately was his downfall, he d says, let's go back to a summit meeting that was scheduled in Paris for 1960. And this time, you know, Mr. Khrushchev, let's make peace. Let's really make peace. Um, because Ike ultimately was the great anti-war president of the 20th century. And uh, this fellow changed that, Francis Gary Powers. And it's Ike's fault. Uh, Ike told um, uh, Alan uh, Dulles, the head of the CIA, who was in charge of the U2 program, you know, let's not take chances. Uh, we're, we're supposed to go in uh, early June, and uh, you wrap everything up with the U2 uh, in uh, early April. Let's not take any chances. Dulles had told Ike, generally, not with enormous specificity, but generally, that you know the Russian fighter planes and missiles have been getting better. There's a fair chance that pretty soon they're going to be able to shoot one of these things down. He had told Ike that. And Ike wanted a, a, a particular part of the Soviet Union uh, overflown by the U-2 because there was supposedly Soviet missiles being developed there. Turned out it wasn't, but uh, that they were in a very early stage, that is. And he wanted that, those photographs. The weather was bad, and the flight scheduled for early April kept getting postponed. And Ike said, you know, it's too close to the summit. Let's call it off. Alan said, no, 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 come on. I'll get, it, I'll get him in there as soon as the weather clears. The weather cleared on April 30, and they sent Powers in on May 1 and shot him down. Allen said to Ike, because Ike was very nervous, he had laid down all, he said, May 1, fine, if you can get him up on May 1, that's good, but not May 2. We've got to call a halt to this. And Allen said, no, no, don't worry. We'll get him up on May 1. The weather cleared, and they did it on May 1. And don't worry. If they shoot down a plane from 70,000 feet, It'll be in smithereens when it hits the ground. It'll be pieces of dust. And Gary Powers will be pieces of dust. And besides, we gave him a cyanide pill. So you, know, you don't have to worry about this. Why they gave him a cyanide pill if they were so certain that he wouldn't survive, I don't know. But uh, Dulles probably believed what he was saying, that if, if there was either engine trouble or, uh, or the Soviets shot him down, that uh, he wouldn't survive, and the plane wouldn't survive. Of course, big pieces of the plane did survive, and uh, Powers parachuted out, and he survived. And they captured him. And Khrushchev really played a PR game in which he ran circles around Ike. Uh, Ike gave out the, the uh, pre-stage uh, story. Uh, we understand that the uh, U.S. weather plane flying in, along the border in Turkey m hit a storm and may have strayed uh, off course. <laughs> and then uh, Khrushchev actually taunted him to say more and to say more, uh, which he did. Uh, and then finally, in front of the Soviet uh, presidium or whatever their legislature is, he paraded pieces of the plane and uh, Colonel Powers, um, and he had Powers broadcast who he was on international uh, newsreels, and and literally embarrassed the living daylights out of Ike. And finally, Ike decided uh, a little late in the game that he better come clean. Uh, he should have come clean the instant it happened. He should have said, just because the weather cleared on May 1 doesn't mean you can send the plane. If you're telling me that there's now a possibility that they can shoot them down. Let's call it quits. But they had gotten so accustomed to flight after flight after flight going off without a hitch that they deluded themselves into thinking uh, that there'll never be a hitch. You can argue that the humiliation that Khrushchev experienced ultimately led him to try to break out of this circle of steel that the United States had thrown around him and put missiles inside of our defense network. Uh, and many historians argue that Khrushchev's ultimate downfall uh, 
as the leader uh, traces directly back to the U2. Uh, but at the time, it was headlines for day after day after day. And it pretty much, oh, uh, Eisenhower said, well, I'll go to Paris and we'll see what happens. Everybody came and Khrushchev uh, came just long enough to storm out. <laughs> there were no discussions, there were no negotiations. He walked in and said, the hell with you guys, you're terrible, you're evil, you're all the terrible things I've been saying about you all along, and here's the proof. Yet the indisputable fact remains that Ike was our only two-term 20th century president to keep the nation out of war for his entire term in office. Yes, sir. What, what war did Bill Clinton preside over? The Balkan War. What? The Balkan War. Uh, you and I were not drafted for that war, so it doesn't bulk as large. I was, maybe you weren't. <laughs> the, uh, it's possible. Uh, uh, that was a shooting war. Uh, we didn't send in ground troops, but uh, we were heavily involved in the air. Um, and, uh, What's it officially declared? No, there, I don't believe there's been a declaration. I don't believe, someone can correct me on this. I don't believe that we have ever had a congressional declaration of war since Pearl Harbor. We have no idea. Right? So it just went out of fashion. We don't declare war anymore. We just go shoot. Yes, sir. Yes, that's going to come up in a subsequent class. We had a lot of involvement, but not with American combat troops. And indeed, that's one of the places where I'm, I, uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but because we're going to devote a whole class to Ike's policy of <coughs> secretly interfering with governments he didn't like. Um, it's probably the worst legacy by far of the Eisenhower administration. Because with a few exceptions, we really hadn't done that before. We used to mess around with countries in Central and South America but we did it openly. We'd send the Marines in. Uh, but Eisenhower began a program of secretly uh, overthrowing governments that he didn't care for, uh, that I think is just a horrible legacy of the Eisenhower administration. Another class, have to come back. <laughs> have to come back. Who else wants to say anything uh, so far? Yes, sir. Apropos of this whole concept of not getting involved in, in other people's little wars and policing the world. He, after he leaves office, and when, when Johnson is finally president and is up to his armpits in Vietnam, and goes and talks to him and asks for his advice in relation to what the army wants to do, and asking for more and more troops, Eisenhower strongly encourages him, and, and he does, in fact, do what Eisenhower suggests. Yes, uh, and that's consistent with Eisenhower's World War II policy. If you're going to get into a fight, use everything you got and win it. His point would be, if you're, gonna f if you're in Vietnam for some purpose that you believe is legitimate, then the only point to being in a war is winning it. And the only way to win it is to throw everything you've got at it. And he did tell Eisenhower uh, to do that because he didn't believe in limited wars. Uh, but you're right, that's in a way um, a, a, a uh, inconsistency but I th uh, with his prior policy as president. But I think the way it came up, the way Johnson presented it was I don't think he said to Ike, should we just tuck tail and run? Because that would have been anathema to Johnson as well. He was probably uh, framing it in a way where Eisenhower would say, oh, you, you want to have a successful result in Vietnam? You go for broke. You, you're in a war, you gotta, you gotta win it. But you're right, it's not completely consistent with this. And my guess is that during the 50s, you know, his refusal to get involved in Vietnam, despite a lot of people telling him to, was much more consistent with the policy that he followed.
Hang on one second. Yes, sir. Isn't there another inconsistency, though? In 1945, Eisenhower, and I've just learned this from you today, uh, didn't want to drop the bombs on Japan. But there was a reason for that. The reason was because, rightly or wrongly, and he was not, you know, in charge of the Pacific Theater, but rightly or wrongly, uh, he was absolutely convinced that the Japanese were on the verge of collapsing. And that was the argument he made. Uh, and there have been others who have made that argument. I happen to disagree with it. Uh, but, you know, he was, as a very senior military commander, dealing with the kind of world leaders that he dealt with face to face at Yalta, he had a lot of information. Uh, and he was convinced Japan was about to topple. And he had a, a better understanding of just how awful a nuclear bomb was going to be than many people did because he had seen uh, the results, for example, of firebombing in Dresden and Tokyo and places like that. Uh, but you're right. Uh, it is amazing that a man who uh, talked the nuclear talk so consistently opposed actually dropping the bomb in a specific situation. Yeah, that's unbelievable. You know, in terms of Okinawa and the kamikazes, you know, why would he think Japan wasn't going to fight to the last man? I can't imagine why he would think that, but that's what he said he thought. And at least for my relatives who were in the Pacific War, they said that decision was an easy one to drop the bombs. You know, the, the Japanese yeah. didn't take many prisoners. No. No. So it's a whole different story than, you know, Eisenhower's thought Yeah, the, uh, what I'm citing as the authority for that viewpoint is Eisenhower. Maybe he's full of baloney. But what he said was that he absolutely and explicitly opposed dropping the bomb because he was certain that Japan was about to collapse anyway. Uh, I don't agree with that. I don't think, I agree with you, Bob. I think, uh, for most uh, military people, all the evidence on the ground was they were going to fight uh, to the end. Yes, ma'am. Is it possible that um, his parents' pacifism maybe did affect him, where, you know, morally it was came to pass yeah, that he couldn't do it? It's, it's an interesting thought. And um, did you all hear that, by the way? She's, uh, the lady is wondering if his parents' pacifism, which was a central part of their uh, version of Christianity, uh, might have had an impact on his thinking about nuclear warfare. I can't really add anything to that other than what I've said because I don't have any special insight. It's a good thought, but his military career suggests uh, that he didn't feel that way because most senior military people in 1945, 46, 47, 48, if you look at what they wrote and spoke publicly, they didn't see the atomic bomb as anything other than a bigger, better bomb. They didn't see it as a, something that had stepped across a moral divide. They just thought, it was, hey, now we've got an even better bomb. Uh, but they didn't see it with a kind of moral horror that many of us look at it now. Uh, and Eisenhower was part of that. He, in, indeed, up until the time of his presidency, and even into the first year or two, if you go by what he said in public, it's just an even better weapon than last year's model. Hang on, you, sir. Um, you we'll come see, right back. Uh, from what I read, how he kept us out of Vietnam, in 56, after the French pulled out the Viet Viet Phu, the question was, should the Americans go into that vacuum and take over. And he asked people to look into this. And Matthew Ridgway, who was chief of staff, came and did a great service to this country. He said, yeah. it'll take over five years, 50,000 lives, and $50 billion. And 500,000 men. 500, You're 100% right. 500,000 yeah. men, and Churchill said, no. And that's exactly what happened. Yes. The, uh, the uh, <coughs> report that Matthew Ridgway wrote at Eisenhower's request is touted as one of the best pieces of analysis by any US military man in the history of our country. Ridgway was terrific. Uh, 
and uh, you know has been overshadowed uh, to some degree by the huge personalities of an Eisenhower, a MacArthur, a Patton. But Ridgway was A plus, and his report to Eisenhower was definitive and prescient to a. I mean, he was right on. He, he every single. Uh, projected fact and figure that he gave is exactly what came to pass. Oh, yes, sir. I recently read a book on the life of Harry Truman written by a great American historian, David McCullough. And in this book, there are many pages about the discussions at the highest levels with Harry Truman and General Marshall and the Chief of Staffs. And in these discussions came out something that has not been mentioned here, and that is that the atomic bomb in Hiroshima saved one million American lives that would have been lost in the invasion of the islands, and two million Japanese lives that would have been lost. Another fact in this book was there was at least 800 kamikaze pilots on the island of Japan waiting for the American ships to destroy them at sea with the uh, tens of thousands of American uh, soldiers and sailors on board. So we, the American people, generations after, have to see the use of the atomic bomb as a way to save lives. It shortened the war. We have to ask ourselves, why was the second bomb necessary at uh, Nagasaki? Because the emperor was so strong, a religious godlike figure to the people of Japan, and they would not uh, capitulate after one bomb, it had to take two. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of truth to that. You should, uh, you were all able to hear him all right? Yeah. But there are a lot of uh, historians who argue with a part of what you're saying, uh, only a part. First of all, uh, you're a absolutely right. The projections of what it would take to invade uh, Japan if they continued to resist the way they had. Uh, was uh, a million American casualties, two million Japanese. The only thing I would say to that is those were projections. Those were not facts. Those were the projections that Truman and his senior advisors were dealing with. That's all they had to deal with. They had to deal with projections. But let's not confuse projections with fact. Number two, the um, I happen to agree with you that the second, if the first bomb was necessary, the second bomb was necessary. But there are historians uh, citing Japanese documents um, of, the, of the time from the highest levels of the Japanese government who argue that the lack of an immediate response to the first bomb was made up of two parts. Number one, uh, the government had been thrown into complete confusion by this thermonuclear blast. The, remember, the concept of an entire major city disappearing, disappearing, was beyond anybody's imagination. But number two, and this is where there's been a lot of argument, and I don't have a dog in this fight, uh, but you should be aware of it. Number two, the argument that was holding up a Japanese response at the most senior levels was uh, an argument about whether Japan should accede to Truman's demand for total surrender, including um, uh, a rejection uh, of Hirohito as emperor. And that, in fact, say these historians, uh, if we had not insisted on a public statement by the Japanese that they were giving up into total surrender. And if we had been willing to say, and we can discuss the emperor's future, that they would have surrendered. And a lot of historians believe that the uh, loss of life at Nagasaki uh, was completely unnecessary, that all we had to do was say, surrender and we'll discuss Hirohito's future. I, and they cite, you know, a lot of authority for it. I am, I mean, I'm in no better position to know the truth of that than anybody in this room. I'm, I will say I'm skeptical.
but I do believe that the first part had some truth. Maybe we should have waited a day or two or three more because there, there's no question that they were in a state of shock. I, 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 don't think they, I don't think they had any choice about dropping the first bomb as a, based on what they knew at the time. My point about the second bomb is twofold. Number one, there are a lot of historians who fight about that. I'm not one of them. And I think a reasoned argument can be made in hindsight that we should have waited a few more days before dropping the second bomb. I never said we shouldn't do it. I said there's an argument that looks good in hindsight that we should have waited a few more days. There are arguments against that. Remember, as I, and please correct me if you think I'm wrong about this, we only had two bombs. That's, that's the point I was trying to make. And the next one were different types. Correct. Yeah. The Russian was in the right. And the first time it had ever been tested. It's a tough, it's a tough area. But at least argue with me about what I am saying and not what I'm not. Uh, yes, sir. I read some recent books that have indicated that there was evidence that the Japanese were sending signals that they're willing to surrender. And the sticking point was they did not want to surrender unconditionally. Yes, that's what I said. <laughs> Let's not forget one thing that's at least crystal clear to me. We didn't start this war. Let's not forget what happened at Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. There in the back. Wasn't there also a concern, maybe a fear, they wanted to get the war over with before the Soviets had to involve? Yes, there was definitely a uh, belief that they should end the war before the Soviets got involved. But my own stomach says that that was not decisive. It was, it was part of the discussion, but not decisive. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll stay. But on that note, we should finish.